So how long have you been chefing? What was it? Uh, chefing since I was 16. Um, I started off in uh, Hilton Hotel in Glasgow, five star, three was set. Uh, and then from there I decided I was going to be the best chef in the world, like most young chefs do, and started travelling. So I went up north, Stephen Castle, Tate Beckham Hotel, uh, both three was there at the time, then down to London, worked on Ramsey for a short period of time in London, came back to Glasgow to work for him in the palace, uh, left there, I really after that, went to Paris, left Paris, went to Italy, left Italy, went to New Zealand, New Zealand to Thailand, spent a lot of time in Thailand, fell in love with the country, fell in love with the food, produce, the whole thing, whole nine works. Back to Italy again, got two Michelin star on Master Year Don Santi in the south of Italy. Uh, yeah, and then came back to Glasgow. Uh, you said you travelled in Thailand, was that the start of it? I mean, obviously you'd have come across Asian food before, but... Uh, yeah, well, to be fair, my experience of Asian food before going travelling was the, the, the local Chinese restaurant, you know, uh, Chinese, the usual sort of thing. Got to Asia and I made myself a promise when I touched down. And I'd done this like a lot of ships do. I touched down in Bangkok, didn't have anywhere to stay, nothing, knew no one, was on my own. I just went for it and it was what an experience. The first two or three days were just like eye opening, it was amazing. Uh, eating some amazing fruits and stuff. Fruits that you thought were like apples, oranges and stuff and they weren't, you know. So uh, the first experience with dragon fruits, I didn't know what to do with it, it was quite funny. Which is obviously quite common now, but this is back in 2002. So yeah, uh, and then curries. Curries just sitting at the side of the road for the whole day, bubbling away in the heat rather than actually heating them. <laughs> yeah. So there's lots of time in the night markets and the... Uh... Yeah, the night market in Hewitt seemed to be my favourite. Uh, it's three streets of food. <laughs> King prawns, bigger than our lobsters. Uh, just, yeah, it's a chef's dream, it really is. It's all these sort of foods, and you just walk up by them, take them down the beach, light a fire and, and go for it. You know, the Aussies and the New Zealand guys, they, they loved it, you know, you're like, oh, Rob's cooking tonight, great, we all need to go to the beach, you know. So I spent a few months in Hugh Hinn, uh, just experiencing the food, and I even went and worked in a little Thai boxing academy, I was actually training, uh, and I got to cook their food for them, but it was their food, you know, so it was rice with a sort of measles ramen in it, and a bit of chicken thigh, each, a day. So, and learning how you had to make it taste good, because if it didn't taste good, they didn't eat it, and they didn't eat for the whole day. So that was, I forgot to admit, that was so much pressure, because I was training with them, and I knew if I didn't taste it nice, <laughs> didn't make it taste nice, I wasn't eating either. Presumably so, also, if you didn't make it taste nice, and they're not eating all day, and you're, and you're getting in the ring with them. I was That's... getting a thumping, yes. <laughs> I was getting a thumping anyway, if I'm being honest. <laughs> I'm not gonna lie there. Uh, but no, it was, it was very, very, very good. And uh, when you go up to the, the north, and in my personal opinion, that's where the food gets serious really serious. Uh, you know, there's this guy's making lap, which is a new addition to our menu as well. Uh, and lap in Thai just means mixed protein, mixed meat. Uh, so it's a salad and there's all different types of pestle mortars. People see pestle mortars and they think the shop, oh, it's just one looks better than another. It's all for grinding different things down. So you've got a wood one, a granite one, and a marble one. And uh, the wood one's usually cut into the base of a tree in Thailand, which is really cool. Uh, and yeah, they do it for all different things. Uh, so up in north of Thailand, you've got like northern Thai yellow curry, which we've got on the Burmese curry, the, the laps uh, and lap. If anyone's never tried it, I, I urge you to come and try it. It is a salad. If you don't eat salads, this is for you. I was going to say, is it Glasgow salad? But obviously that's chips. But no, no, no. <laughs> Glasgow salad would be to put it in tempura butter and deep fry it. Uh, but <laughs> no, it's uh, lap is basically every part of an animal that wouldn't normally be used is chopped up as fine as possible with about 20 different spices and then fried at a really really high heat to bring a bitterness to it and it's amazing but again awful doesn't sell well so we've then taken that right back and done the same process with Chateaubriand and chicken fillet and the end product is a really really sweet but spicy and you just can't get enough of it honestly it's like you start eating it and you're 120, 130, 140 grams of salad down and you're like have a wee drink and then I'll go back to it, you know, and you just can't get enough of it. For me anyway, if you, if you love the flavour, it's just amazing, you know. But Chateaubriand, people should go for that. Well, I, that's an expensive cut of meat to put in there, to, to chop up and... Yes, it, it, it hurts. <laughs> every, every knife going through that bit of meat hurts. But at the same time, it's what we have to do to sell it to the masses. You know, if people just say, we were going to use top side and then D-Rump, but again, people don't, that's not recognisable cut of meat unless you, you know the industry so we had to go with something that really stood out something that's really a luxury product you know people go in and order Chateaubriand for two uh, and it's an amazing cut of meat and I've got to admit I had the choice to have the roast but I'm Scottish so that's the way it works <laughs> but yeah so the, the, the Chateaubriand lap and the, the chicken lap is exceptionally good for a salad you know I'm not a big salad person myself 
and it just was. So I, I do apologies to try the lap. <laughs> so you, you've, you've been around much of, uh, you've worked around much of Europe, you've been to Thailand, you've been around a lot of Asia, mm -hmm. um, cooked in all these sorts of different kitchens from, um, you know, quite humble, modest kitchens up to two-star Michelin. Yeah. It, what's the, I mean, uh, are you finding that chefs throughout the world are much the same? Is there a sort of brotherhood of chefs, a sort of... Yeah, it's... One thing, the main thing I missed when being out of the kitchens for six years, and that's why I've done so many stagiaries and stuff in the kitchens that I was doing recruitment for, was the banter, the, and it just doesn't matter what country you're in, doesn't matter what language it's in, just anything goes, you know, and I, I Glaswegian, quite a sarcastic person, it just works, you know, and even in Asia, when I knew the, the ties were taking, taking the mic a fair bit out of me because I couldn't operate the walk burner with my foot, you know. Uh, and I'm just like, you, you know, like you guys are using your knee, it's my foot, it's that low, you know. <laughs> so, there was only one guy in a kitchen team of 78 chefs, I think it was, that spoke English. So every time I needed something, I had to find him. <laughs> That's tricky. Over three floors in the Five Star Hilton in Bangkok, so. Imagine you'd be chasing each other around, wouldn't they? Yeah, well, I used to get phone calls at like three in the morning, we need you to come and cook a steak. <laughs> so they'd send a tuk tuk to pick me up and then back just to cook a steak and then away again. Because <laughs> presumably they don't have any experience of cooking a steak. It's just yeah, well, some of them were quite good, but you, you would get Americans in who wanted uh, medium well or whatever, and I'd, I'd done specs for them with temperature probes so that they could get it right, but then if it was an important customer, they didn't want to get it wrong. And, you know, but these guys could run rings around me, uh, and then I would come in and cook a steak, and they thought I was brilliant. It's the opposite way around. These, these guys, if we, us in Britain as chefs, think we work hard, go to Asia. These guys are in there for five with the breakfast chefs, and they think as a breakfast chef that doesn't exist. These guys work right through to so eleven at night. They don't go outside. They don't see the sunshine. And then they go home. They do that six days a week, and they only get seven days holiday a year. How do they let off steam? I can't imagine. It must be like a volcano it, suddenly. It's, it's it's a different vibe. Everybody's so placid, you know. So you know, yeah, the services get a bit heated and a bit shouty and stuff, but you know. I couldn't tell what they were saying anyway, so I was just oblivious to it. Uh, and it, it was amazing. Uh, and then you would get loads of Brits and stuff coming to do cook-offs for the, the nicer side of the restaurants and stuff like that. But the kitchens, and it's just a different world because there's no cost restraints because of how, stuff, how cheap the stuff is. Even equipment in the country is, but then you've got Westerners or people from Europe and stuff coming and paying European prices for stuff that costs a quarter of the price here. So. The money they're making, it's actually profitable being in the restaurant business in Asia. Uh, right down to your little huts, at the side of the road, you know, you go in and you, you actually hear the chicken getting slaughtered out the back when you order it and stuff. Uh, can put you off, but at the same time, it works, you know.